now that we're in Christ and uh, the law of Moses, as it were, has been uh, done away with all its myriad aspects, with all its different modes and ways of worship and sacrifice, um, our worship has changed drastically since the days of the law of Moses. Uh, there's, there's, there's no more rituals that we have to keep in the sense that we had to keep under the law of Moses. Uh, in fact, when I think about it, there's probably only two, perhaps three rituals that in New Testament times were commanded to keep. So these are uh, baptism, uh, which, of course, we only do once, uh, bread and wine, which we do every week. And the third one that we might put into that category of, uh, I guess, a ritual in some kind would be the idea of head coverings. Now, um, not to minimize the idea of head coverings at all, because it's totally an important part of, of, uh, of our worship. Uh, and it demonstrates, of course, a really important principle, a recognition, recognition of different roles between men and women. Um, but it's more of an adjunct to our worship uh, rather than like a central feature uh, in the same way in which perhaps baptism and uh, the partaking of bread and wine are to our way of worship. And, and I guess I guess the rarity, the rarity of, uh, of rituals in our worship, I think, probably makes the ones that we do have all the more important. Now, the first two of these, uh, the idea of baptism and the idea of uh, the taking of bread and wine, when you think about it, are pretty strange ideas on the surface of things. If you were just to, we're so familiar with them because we grew up with them and we're, we've been so exposed to them now that it's just a matter of norm. But if you take a step back and think of what it would be like to watch a baptism or watch someone partake of bread and wine from the outside. If you were a non-Christadelphian or, or even if you were a young child growing up and kind of going, oh, what's, what's going on here? And you're witnessing a baptism. You have all these questions. Uh, take, take baptism, for, for instance. Um, all of a sudden, you've got people all around that come to see this particular event. Uh, a, a member of the group puts on clothes that they can get wet because they don't usually go into the baptismal bath, at least in New Zealand, in your shirt and tie. Um, uh, they testify in front of a crowded room that, yes, they do believe the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And then upon this public declara declaration of their faith, they go down into the water, they're baptized, they're fully immersed, uh, they come up soaking wet. Sometimes they're gasping for breath. Sometimes water's shot up their nose. Uh, and uh, whatever whatever it is, um, they're usually beaming with happiness, and there's an enormous sense of joy present amongst everyone. And for an, for an interested onlooker, the whole scene is um, is uh, a little bit bizarre, almost for um, for what it is. Then they go into a little tiny room and get changed, and then come back out, and they're all freshly clothed and you know um, wet hair and, and whatnot. But it's a strange, it's a strange kind of ritual, really, when you when you break it down and look at it that way from an outsider's perspective. What about bread and wine? Okay, so you've got a group of people all coming together into one place. You have a person that takes a piece of bread that gets um, there's, there's a wee ritual that takes place beforehand. There's there's some serving brethren that go up the front that take a little platter of bread, take it around different members of the congregation. Different people take a little a piece of bread. When the wine comes around, they take a cup. Or um, if, if you have a, a one larger cup, you take a sip from the cup. Uh, and then everyone seems to suddenly close their eyes. Um, at least mostly, some people don't. I remember when I was younger uh, and, and uh, watching an older sister not close her eyes during the memorials and thought, that's terrible. Um, and then I've, I've since come to, I guess, more appreciate, okay, there's different ways and different things that people might do or not do. Um, but generally, eyes, eyes are closed. Uh, there's, the, there's the quiet munching on a piece of bread. There's the quiet um, swallowing of a mouthful of wine. There's a whole chorus of coughs that take place uh, at some point afterwards when people choke on their wine um, or it goes down the wrong way or something happens. And then there's this general atmosphere of silence. It's a very personal kind of special time, apparently, for everyone. Uh, and, and then there's this really this real feeling of being united with others around the room. 
Um, and that's the idea of, of bread and wine from, I guess, an interested onlooker. So as a ritual, you know, we, 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 we're so familiar with it, but we take, when we take a step back, it's, uh, it's um, you know, it's, 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 slightly, it's slightly strange. And yet, and yet to us as Christadelphians, these things, they're the very essence of our worship. Nothing gives us more joy and nothing gives us more encouragement than when we get to go and see someone else get baptized. Probably getting baptized ourselves is one of the greatest moments of our lives. As far as the moral meeting is concerned, okay, yep, we may attend Sunday school or CYC or public lectures or Bible class or uh, Bible schools or youth conferences or whatever it is. But over and above all of these, attending the memorial meeting is probably the crowning moment of all our gatherings together. True? So nothing's more important than, than, than this in our worship. It's the very, I guess, the very minimum attendance requirement. We may miss the occasional lecture or Bible class or whatever it is, but nothing causes more disquiet within ourselves than missing memorial meeting. Nothing causes more concern from other people than when you miss the memorial meeting. Like these, these are these this, these are fundamental truths which we'd all probably agree with. I guess now before we delve into to bread and wine itself in more detail, because we've talked about this in the context of baptism as well, it's helpful to appreciate how inextricably linked bread and wine is with baptism. And um, I'd like to share uh, this table with you here because you see baptism and the memorials really demonstrate very similar principles. Baptism is when we are taken into Christ to become a part of his body. Uh, we become part of the body of Christ and baptism uh, enables us to be a part of that body. The memorials on the other hand, are when Christ is taken into us. And as Christ says, uh, whoso eats my flesh and drinks, um, uh, drinks my blood, uh, we, we, we take him into us. It's his flesh and his blood. We become part of his body in that way. Um, baptism is our association with the death and resurrection to life of Christ. We go down into the waters of baptism and we rise from the waters of baptism, and it's a symbolic symbol, a symbol of a way in which we go down into the grave and come out of the grave a new person. There's a new life, just as Christ died and rose from the dead. And in, in like fashion, the memorials are our association with the death and resurrection to life of Christ. Baptism, we do once in our lives, of course, but the moral principle behind baptism is that we do it in spirit every day of our lives. Equally, the memorials we keep once a week, but the moral principle behind them is that we do this in spirit every day of the week. Um, baptism involves a positive identification with Christ. Everything is to do with, with being with him. So when we're baptized, we're buried with him uh, by baptism into death. We're dead with Christ, but we're also going to live with him. We're buried with him in baptism, and we're risen with him. Uh, and in like manner, the, the memorials involve a positive identification with being with Christ and eating and drinking with him. So the 12 disciples, when the hour was come, he sat down, the 12 apostles were with him. For Acts 10, unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And the promise of Christ in Revelation 3 is, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So these are things that we do with Christ. Whether he's present or not, we do it in symbol and in type, being with him. Uh, as it was, uh, as it was um, uh, with the disciples originally. And of course, baptism is essential for salvation and eternal life. Mark 16 um, uh, Except you be uh, uh, baptized, you cannot be saved. That's a paraphrase, but I think you know the verse I'm talking about. Um, or uh, John 6, memorials are essential for salvation and eternal life. Um, I will read this one out. So John 6, verse, um, verse 53 and 54. Um, 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So you see, when you look at the concepts of baptism, you look at the concepts of the memorials, the bread and wine, they declare similar principles. Both baptism and the memorials are the means by which we have fellowship with God. They're the means by which we have eternal life. They're the means by which uh, we, we're reconciled to God. Um, baptism is the way in which we are, we're born again into a new way of life. We become no longer a constituted as a sinner, but constituted as a saint. Uh, partaking of bread and wine then continues that work of building a harmonious relationship between God and man. If we, of course, um, approach God in spirit and in truth. And the bread, of, bread and wine are therefore not just a basic meal, but it's a basic fellowship meal. We identify ourselves, that is, we have fellowship with the death and resurrection of Christ. So <clears throat> um, what do the bread and wine uh, individually signify? And is there a difference between the two? Because I think... Um, I don't know about you, but I think sometimes when we think of bread and wine and when we take a bread and wine on Sunday, we can sometimes think of the bread as being, I guess, maybe perhaps a predominantly negative symbol. Um, that is the, the symbol of all the ideas of the flesh being put to death, the body being crucified on the cross, which is absolutely true. Uh, and we tend to think of the wine as a, as a predominantly positive symbol. This represents now newness of life. This represents the cleansing of our sins uh, and I guess a slightly more positive aspect um, re, um, rather than the bread. But if we take a step back and look at what bread and wine are associated with in Scripture, we find that they represent both positive and negative things. So here's a list. Uh, we're not going to look up every, every passage here, but just by means of demonstration. Uh, bread stands for in Scripture the concepts of affliction, tears, sorrows, wickedness, deceit, idleness, adversity, mourning, malice and wickedness. And yet it also stands for strength and wisdom and cheerfulness and life, sincerity and truth. Negative and positive. When we come to look at the wine, we find the same thing. It has the idea of judgment, astonishment, violence, fury, astonishment and desolation, suffering, devils, wrath, abominations and filthiness. Uh, and then on the other hand, it has the ideas of cheerfulness and blessing and gladness and salvation and wisdom. So a, a marked contrast where both the bread and the wine represent something, I guess, good and something bad, something positive, something negative. And it's roughly half and half. Um, uh, rather than one being particularly known for positive things and one being particularly known for negative things. So I guess if we take a step back and just simply look at not the memorials in and of itself, but simply just the bread and wine in Scripture, both the bread and the wine in Scripture are individually capable of representing both the negative and the positive aspects of Christ's sacrifice, that is, of his death and of his resurrection. Their primary significance is not to do one and not the other, but to do both. And by doing so, to, uh, to reinforce one another. So I guess the next question is, well, why have two symbols for ex effectively the same thing? Uh, why not just have one? Why not just have one symbol and go, this is it. That's all you need. If they represent the same thing, here's your one symbol. You just need to do this. Well, uh, Christ is very clear that we need to do both. So uh, John 6, verse 53, Verily, uh, verily I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. It wasn't one or the other. It had to be both. And I guess from a natural perspective, this makes sense as well. We talk about bread and wine being a basic meal or a basic fellowship meal. Well, um, if we were to only eat or only drink, we would die. We need both food and liquids to, uh, to, to survive from day to day. 
we need both to be sustained. And the same is true from a spiritual perspective. Of course, there's doubled for emphasis as well. You may know this passage, but Genesis 41 verse 32, the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. Why? Because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. So it's a Bible principle that when you've got something occur twice, the message we've been told is, well, you do this twice, or I'm going to tell you this twice or in two different ways to doubly reinforce the message. This is important. So it's doubled for emphasis. Uh, now, why bread and wine? So we've, we've seen that both are important, um, but why, why bread and wine in and of itself? Uh, like like if, if you were to choose a symbol for, um, for individuals to, to remember you by, why choose bread and wine and not like, why not meat and milk? Or, or why not um, cheese and, and water? Um, well, the answer is a number of things. Firstly, there's a link to Passover. So, uh, of course, unleavened bread and cups of wine were part of the Passover meal. They were items that were practically already at hand. And in measure, the Passover that is, will be instituted uh, by Christ will have its counterpart, of course, in the Old Testament Passover. There will be similar concepts and similar themes of uh, salvation, bringing out of Egypt and, and, and these kind of ideas. So there's a link to Passover and, and they're naturally going to be at hand. Christ in the upper room, he's not going to suddenly go, hang on, uh, where's, where's the cheese and, and water or where's the, where's the, you know, where's the meat and, um, and, and, and milk? No, no, like bread and wine is going to be there already because it's the Passover meal. Um, secondly, well, Christ was a priest, <clears throat> of course, not after the order of Aaron, uh, which was about to pass away, but after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek, of course, Genesis <clears throat> chapter 14, brought forth bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God. You see, the work of Christ had been foreordained. He was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek brought forth bread and wine. It's only going to be appropriate that the priest after this order Christ will likewise bring forth bread and wine. Um, also, bread and wine were symbols of Christ's life, death, and resurrection in three key ways. Firstly, they are the product of a huge amount of time and labor. Now, I'm no baker, and I'm no, I think the word is viticulturist, or viticulturalist, or something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm no professional when it comes to either of these things, although I have worked in a vineyard for a few weeks, um, and that taught me a few things. But when we take bread, for instance, bread that we see on the table today is the end result of uh, someone that's gone out and plowed the field. Then they've engaged in sowing, and then they've had to do some weeding. Then they've watered, then they've waited, they've harvested, they've threshed, They've winnowed, they've ground the grain, they've mixed it all together, they've kneaded the dough, they've put it in the oven and they've baked it. So it's actually a huge amount of work for from grain in the field to bread on the table. It's actually a huge amount of work. Uh, wine is exactly the same. It's the end result of planting, uh, of watering, of pruning, of thinning, of harvesting, of crushing the grapes, of sieving everything out, getting rid of imperfections and, and impurities, of, of a fermentation process, of, of, I guess, tasting or waiting for the right moment when it's ready to be had, and then when it's right, putting it in a bottle and preparing it. So the, the, the labor involved here in simply preparing bread and wine is going to typify the work involved in Christ's life, death, and resurrection. You see, his atoning work that was to bring about the salvation of mankind was not a simple or easy thing to accomplish. There was so much time and so much labor required to bring it into effect. When you consider all the different prophecies that Christ had to fulfill, uh, the way in which he had to be a perfectly sinless sacrifice, the way in which angels had to be involved, uh, prophets had to prophesy about him, kings had to play a part in, in his life, wise men were present, uh, rulers um, dictated terms, 
uh, family were involved. The disciples had to be involved too. The common people um, were all part of this. Uh, the Jewish uh, r- rulers, uh, all these different members of the public, members of society in previous years to Christ and then in Christ's own day, um, as well as, of course, his own personal development and battle against sin. There was a huge amount of time and effort involved in preparing this individual and then the final triumph involved upon the cross and his subsequent resurrection to eternal life. A huge amount of work and time and labor in like manner as bread and wine are prepared. Uh, They're similar also in the way in which each is made. Of course, the grain goes through a symbolic death and resurrection. It's cut down, it's crushed, it's ground to to pieces, uh, a typical death. And then there's a final loaf that's brought forth. Uh, It it gives life to other people. It gives strength, it gives health, it gives joy, a a type of a symbolic resurrection. Um, the grapes of, um, of the wine, the grapes taken, they're cut down. Again, they're crushed, they're mixed. They go through a typical death, as it were. And then, and then they're resurrected. They're, they're brought forth. There's, a, there's a, a bottle of wine or there's wine that's produced that, that invigorates, that makes glad the heart of man. It goes through a symbolic resurrection as well as death. So the very process by which bread and wine is created you see, demonstrates the principles of death and resurrection. And of course, is the change in state because the loaf that we have on the table, the loaf is as different from the single grain that you see in the field as the bottle of wine is from a single grape. And in like manner, the resurrected man has a completely different makeup from what he was when he was mortal. The physical character or makeup of the end result is completely different from the original ingredients. It's undergone a transformation in nature, a metamorphosis, as it were. So um, in these three key ideas, bread and wine are natural symbols of Christ's death death and resurrection. The time and labor involved, the way in which it's made, the way in which it changes state from one thing to another. Now, what, what are... Um, what are the different expressions in scripture used for partaking of bread and wine, just out of interest? Um, I guess here's, here's the different expressions. The bread is the true wine from heaven. It's the bread of God. It's the bread of life or the living bread. Uh, it's broken bread or uh, bread which, is, which we break. It's described as unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. It's described as the communion of the body of Christ. When we look at the blood, the blood is also, or sorry, the wine. The wine is described as the blood of the new covenant. It's described as the good wine, as the true vine, as the cup of blessing, as the communion of the blood of Christ, as the cup of the Lord. When we look at both together, uh, together they are described as Christ's flesh and blood, uh, uh, Christ our Passover, um, it's just simply the feast or uh, also described as um, feasts of love or feast of charity. Um, it's described as the Lord's table. It's described as the Lord's supper. There's a huge amount of different terminology used in scripture to really signify simply the bread and wine. Lots of different ways, but each of these different ways will convey different concepts and different ideas to draw out and to expand upon Hey, here's a different. Here's another element of the bread. Here's another element of the wine. A different way of viewing this concept. Now, um, there's information concerning the bread and wine, of course, from uh, a range of key passages. And um, perhaps if you can come with me um, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, um, we'll read a few verses from here. Um, uh, of course, um, three of the four gospel records record the memorials, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John omits it. Um, however, John, of course, does record the most amount of detail concerning the time in the upper room. He doesn't directly record the bread and wine, which is very interesting. Um, of course, then you've got the accounts in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 11, which we read before. Um, and probably these, along with perhaps maybe John chapter 6, 
as well, perhaps would be probably the classic passages that we'd think about or turn to in relation to uh, the bread and wine. But if we come to Luke chapter 22, and, and let's just read the context uh, or read the verses uh, concerning the bread and wine. Um, uh, and we'll, let's start from um, Luke 22, verse, uh, verse 7 for context. So there comes a day of unleavened bread. The Passover must be killed. Christ sends Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover. He says, you're going to go into the city. You're going to meet a man uh, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. Say to the goodman of the house, verse 11, the master saith unto thee, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. There, make ready. And so they went, found exactly like it said, and they made ready. And then verse 14, the hours come, he sits down with the 12 disciples and he said to them, with desire, or as the margin says, I have heartily desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And then in the context of all that, he adds, but behold, there's a betrayer with me at the table. Verse 21, uh, woe unto that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. And then they begin to inquire among themselves, who's, who's going to do this thing? And then verse 24, oh, and by the way, there's also a strife amongst them as to which of them should be accounted the greatest. So, um, <clears throat> so, uh, now, how does it start? How does the bread and wine, how is it initiated? How is it instigated? The answer is, it all is instigated at this phrase, the hour is come. Um, um, actually, he does prepare for it before the hour was come. Um, but when the hour was come, he sits down with his disciples. You see, this had been, this was a pre-planned, pre-ordained uh, opportunity. This was the last opportunity to, to, to do this and to spend time with his disciples before his betrayal and before his death. And he initiates it. Um, so the disciples don't initiate, don't initiate it. He initiates it. Um, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, Matthew 26 tells us. Uh, and as we're told, verse 15, I have heartily desired to eat this Passover with you. Now, why did he heartily, why did he heartily desire or, or is the idea conveys desire with a passion or passionately desire to share bread and wine with his disciples. Well, this was the last opportunity to share fellowship, the last opportunity to spend time with his friends, the last opportunity to receive strength, uh, the last opportunity to, uh, to teach them one final thing or to leave them with something um, as, as something, a memorial, as something that they would, they would take away with them. Um, what if he hadn't ordained the bread and wine for his disciples to remember him by? Imagine if we didn't have the bread and wine today. Um, there was no such memorial feast instigated. Well, um, of course, under the law of Moses, you had a range of different feasts or aspects of worship and all these aspects of worship under the law of Moses are here gathered now into this one feast whereas those uh, feasts under the law of Moses were celebrated once a year and everyone came up to Jerusalem to keep them this feast can be personally celebrated every day of our lives and as a community at least once a week without this of course we don't have a specific reason to meet we don't have a focal point around which we worship. We don't have a central celebration that binds us together. And it doesn't just bind us together now. It binds us together in anticipation, in anticipation of what's to come. It points forward to a future meal that we actually share with Christ, that Christ is longing to share with us. And he tells us this, verse 16, I say unto you, I won't eat thereof anymore 
until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Verse 18, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. There's a sense of anticipation in the principles behind this, in that whatever we do now, we are only going to ever truly partake of it with Christ and Christ with us at a future time and at a future date. So it's a, it's a meal that, yes, we partake of now, but it's also a meal that prompts or provokes the anticipation of another meal yet to come. Revelation 19, verse 9, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is, this will be the communion that we will share with our Lord. Revelation 19, verse 9. Now, uh, who partook of the bread and wine? Uh, we're asking some of those questions, and of course, some of them are self-evident, but it's, it's, helpful to, it's helpful to ask these. Who partakes of bread and wine? The answer is, well, in the upper room, it was all the disciples. All of them partook. I believe, in fact, even Judas partook. Um, when you come to the book of Acts and Acts 2, of course, well, uh, it's only those who believed and are baptized that partake. Um, Justin says, uh, who was, I guess, a, an early church father, um, says in AD 100, 150, it is not lawful for anyone to partake except for him who believes a teaching to be true and one who has been washed with the washing for remission of sins and unto regeneration and who lives as Christ ordained. So in the first century and the second century AD, there was a very clear uh I guess, restriction around who partakes. It wasn't just anyone and everyone. You've got to be, uh, you've got to receive the teaching as true. You've got to be washed. You've got to be baptized and you've got to live a, a, a way of life that's consistent with what Christ has said. So there's certain guidelines here. Um, the, the first century ecclesia by um, J.B. Norris actually says this as well. The teaching of the New Testament is that the life of Christ is not begun but by baptism, following belief and repentance. How can a new life be sustained by the breaking of bread, which has not begun? An unborn child is not expected to eat with the family. What he's saying is you have to be born into a new life first before you start eating and drinking. You don't eat and drink first and then be born after that. It has to follow in the right order. You've got to be baptized first. You've got to be... Uh, you've got to be born again into a new life. Now you're part of the family of God. You're part of a new family. And in order to grow within that family, you now partake of bread and wine. You see, there's a, there's a natural order to this uh, that is totally destroyed. As soon as you say, hey, anyone that wants to have bread and wine can have it. No, you don't need to believe. No, you don't really need to be baptized either. Um, yep, just help, come and help yourselves. Um, uh, and, and this is how, I guess, uh, some churches work. There's, um, there's really not a lot of parameters around actually who's allowed to partake of this. Now, um, uh, whilst um, the important thing is this, bread and wine is available for all. Isaiah 55, you know the passage, verse 1 and 2, come ye to the waters, um, all of you come, come by um, bread, milk, uh, without price. Um, why do you... Why do you um, spend money for that which is not bread? These things are freely available, Isaiah says. Come, come, come partake. You know, those that are thirsty, those that are hungry, come eat and drink. It's, it's free. It's a free gift. There's no, um, there's no limitations on those who are permitted to, to, to have these things. It's freely available for all. And yet, God places a condition on those who can partake. Yes, Anyone that wants to is permitted to come if you have uh, submitted to the certain guidelines and framework that God has God has um, has set up. That is, you've got to believe, you've got to be baptized, you've got to be willing to be associated with uh, Christ in uh, your way of life, in your baptism and in your way of life. So this is the answer as to who partakes. Next question is, and again, this is this one's really obvious, but what do they partake of? Um, the answer is, well, of course, bread and wine, but they partake of the same thing. They partake of one loaf and one cup. When Christ uh, instigates the feast, he takes bread and he takes the cup. There's one loaf 
uh, and one cup. It's the same bread and wine. You see, they don't come along to this feast with their own loaf and their own flagon. They come to partake in the loaf and the wine that Christ has prepared. You don't turn up to the meeting, one person with uh, your, your ciabatta roll and your shiraz, and then the other person comes along, walks in the door, and, and in his hand he's got his sourdough bread and his Cabernet Sauvignon. Like They've all got exactly the same bread and exactly the same wine. Um, it's the same meal. First Corinthians 10, all our fathers were baptized in the cloud and in the sea, and they did all eat the same spiritual meat and drink the same spiritual, um, same spiritual meat and, and, and the same spiritual drink. Um, or uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 17, we being many, we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. So the important thing is, the point is, they shared the same bread and wine in the spirit of unity. The fragment of bread which we take on a Sunday, we take from a larger loaf. Uh, the sip of wine that we take is from a larger cup or from at least a larger source, uh, a, a united source. And this creates amongst us a feeling of unity because we're all sharing in the same thing. Uh, well, uh, where did they meet? Well, the very first uh, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a um, we call it the Last Supper, and it's, I guess, the first Last Supper, which is an interesting way of putting it. But um, the, the Last Supper was first instituted in a guest chamber in the house of a fellow disciple in a large upper room that was furnished. And we know that it, at least we know that it was the house of a fellow disciple because um, when he comes, um, uh, uh, Christ's words to his disciples are, "Ye shall say unto the goodman of the house." The master saith unto thee. So the, the goodman of the house was evidently a disciple because he recognized Christ as his master. So if they meet in the guest chamber of a, a house of a fellow disciple. And this seems to be the, the, the habit of first century believers. They broke bread from house to house, Acts 2 tells us. Uh, in Acts 12, they're meeting together in the house of Mary. They gathered together praying. Acts 20, they come together to break bread. And it's, we're told that they break bread in the upper chamber. They're all gathered together. Uh, in, in several of the epistles, um, it's described as the ecclesia being in your house or in his house. So evidently, uh, it was the common practice to meet in people's houses. Um, and uh, well, um, I guess the important thing here is uh, they, they meet together in one place. This is the point. This isn't something that you do in isolation by yourselves. Uh, this is something that you do together with each other. It's meant to be done as part of a wider, larger community group of people. It's not something that you do just, just do simply by yourself. You're not cut off from the rest of the ecclesia. You do it together. Now, of course, COVID times accepted. Like, absolutely. Like, meet in your own, in your own house by yourselves uh, or in your little family. Uh, meeting virtually is totally the next best thing when you can't meet together face to face. Um, but the point is, is that whether you are together in one place physically or together in one place online, not quite as good, I grant you. But the principle is you're meeting together in one place. Um, uh, which is helpful, I think. Um, a helpful thing to bear in mind that you do this together. Um, I think coming out of lockdown, we've experienced in our ecclesia a little more tendency to stay at home and tune in um, where you could actually come. Um, and I guess it's just nice if you do have the opportunity to actually come together and meet together face to face uh, if the opportunity does allow. Um, well, the next question is, well, when did they meet and how often? Well, of course, Acts 2, they did this daily. They meet together every single day to partake in bread and wine. But of course, um, you know, uh, amidst the excitement and enthusiasm of first century times where you have thousands being added every day, you have, um, you have, you know, this ex extraordinary time in history where the truth or the gospel has just been spread and it's spreading like wildfire and everyone's just absolutely so excited. It, it makes sense that in that kind of environment, 
you're doing this every single day. Any opportunity, you're together with other people every single day. Of course, as time goes on, um, it seems that Acts chapter 20, eventually it came to be that they would meet together on the first day of the week because uh, in Acts chapter 20, uh, when Paul comes to Troas, he abides there and it says that upon the first day of the week, verse 7, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, uh, ready to depart on the morrow. So um, at least in some, some sense, it seems that um, it, it came to be that it was on the first day of the week that the disciples met to break bread. Now, this had a practical um, a practical uh, level of, of ease and comfort associated with this. Sunday was a regular working day in most of the Roman Empire in the first and second century. Um, however, believers would meet early on that day, and then they'd be obliged to then head off and go to work. Um, in fact, though, in AD 321, Constantine makes Sunday an official holiday. And of course, that allowed all Christians to meet for the memorial, for the memorial meeting or for mass or whatever it was that they called it. Um, but the point is that it was allowed to be a time off um, in order to celebrate this particular, um, this particular event. It also has a spiritual significance, of course, because the, the Christ was raised on a Sunday morning on the first day of the week. The women go to the tomb to anoint the body with spices very early in the morning, we're told, uh, at the rising of the sun, Mark 16 tells us, uh, and, um, and they do this on Sunday morning, the first day of the week. Uh, and of course, Romans chapter 5 um, has this to tell us as well, Romans 5 and uh, verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. You see, while his death, uh, while his death reconciles us to God, it's his resurrection to life that provides salvation for mankind. Romans 5 verse 10 tells us. So it's appropriate, I guess, in one sense, that the very moment that we come to meet on a Sunday, and yes, we meet at different times, and yes, it's not always at the rising of the sun, thank goodness, um, but the point is, is that this is on, on the same sort of time that Christ was raised, and we come to celebrate Christ's death and resurrection. So there's a, a symbolic um, spiritual significance here. But the important thing is here is, the point is, uh, not whether you're doing it uh, every day or once a week, the point is, is that you're doing it regularly, that you're making it a priority. Um, we just read from Acts chapter 20, Eutychus dies, uh, well, falls down from the loft and he's taken up as dead. Christ, oh, sorry, Paul brings him back to life. Um, and then Paul carries on back up into the upper room and they just carry on going. And then they break bread after that moment in time. So um, it continues even after the death of Eutychus. This was the level of priority. Like a death wasn't enough to stop the disciples from partaking of bread and wine. Yes, of course. In fact, in and of itself, it was probably a beautiful type of a death and resurrection. And then all of a sudden, now you're partaking of bread and wine, remembering the death and resurrection of Christ. So that would have been, that would have been an extraordinary thing in Acts 20 to, to, um, to celebrate together. What a special time that would have been. Um, of course, Hebrews 10, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching, as we see the day of Christ return approaching, it's even more important. Yep. We're doing this, we're making it regular, we're making it a priority. You know, some churchgoers celebrate Easter. They do this once a year. This is their one opportunity, one time a year to remember the work of Christ. And every other day of the year, almost every other Sunday, it gets ignored and, and pushed to one side. And all they do is just once every year, they go, oh, yeah, Christ, death and resurrection. Oh, that's kind of important. We should remember that. Um, of course, um, uh, which is incredibly hard to be a disciple and only do that once a year and still maintain a strength of faith. So that's why we do it at least once a week. <clears throat> um, now, next question is, how does what we do today uh, reflect or compare to the biblical model? Now, I appreciate we come from um, different ecclesias. <clears throat> uh, we live in different countries uh, uh, and 
uh, probably the way that we do things is probably slightly differently. Uh, but the essential order I, I, I trust, uh, perhaps not, but I trust will be broadly the same. Um, and that is, there will be a preparation phase. So there's a, there's a preparation phase. There's preparation made to make ready the room, to make sure that it was furnished. Um, so this is like, this is like um, members of the Ecclesia doing hall cleaning uh, in the week before you then come on Sunday and, uh, and meet together. They do hall cleaning. They, they clean the hall. They like get rid of all the dust. They get rid of all the rubbish. They make sure the chairs are like, uh, you know, are, are, are rightly sort of lined up in the little aisles. Um, the, the, the doorman comes, the doorman comes, he unlocks the door. Uh, he puts the chairs out. He turns all the heaters on or fans on, depending on where you're from uh, and how hot or cold it is. He opens all the windows, whatever it is. He prepares the room. There's a there's a process to furnish. Um, uh, the, the 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 table brother or sister um, prepares the bread and wine. He or she gets put on gets put on the table at the front. It's covered. Um, there's uh, preparation and people um, being told what jobs are going to be done beforehand. Um, the, the, the presiding brother um, puts up the hymn numbers and the readings on the board at the front. Um, the pianist has been practicing hymns. It's, it's a preparation phase. Okay. Um, so very similar to what was done initially. Um, there's a set designated time when the hour was come, Luke tells us. Now, of course, we don't we don't change when we meet on a Sunday morning every week. We don't go, oh, today it's going to be 10.30 and next week it's going to be 11.30 and next week it's going to be 9 o'clock. Um, there's, there's a set time. And yes, that can change if you want to meet together and change it. But the point is, is that it's a, it's a set designated time. It's not a sporadic, last minute, spontaneous, oh, yeah, let's get together and maybe do this. It's, it's set, it's in the program, it's, it's when the time has come. It's a set designated time. There's a spirit of service involved. John 13 tells us uh, that Christ girded himself. He, he, took a, he took a towel and he began to wash the disciples' feet. There's a spirit of, of service. And Luke 7 verse 46 tells us the incident of Simon the Pharisee. Christ says, I entered your house. You didn't wash my feet or, or give me a kiss of, uh, uh, by way of greeting. Um, and this was the common thing that you did when someone entered uh, into your place. As a host, you were to kiss them on the cheek and then uh, wash their feet and make sure that they were well rested and, um, and ready to sit down. So there's a, there's a process uh, involved in welcoming others um, that involves service as well. So this is like the, the role of a host. And I guess the host in, in animal meetings is, is the doorkeeper. The doorkeeper stands at the door, he welcomes, he shakes hands. Um, depending on your style, uh, you kiss people as they walk in. Um, but whatever it is, there's a, there's a mode of greeting, there's a spirit of service to make sure that other people feel welcome. Uh, there's a reading from the Law and the Prophets. Um, and um, uh, and uh, this was the common practice in the synagogue. Um, and we won't go into it in uh, detail, um, but Nehemiah chapter eight has this beautiful um, series of um, um, of allusions to to the Last Supper. There's a gathering that's involved. Um, there's a reading that takes place. There's prayers that take place. There's an exhortation. The day is described as a holy day, and then the people partake in bread and wine. So Nehemiah chapter eight is a, is a beautiful type of of what happens in, in the partaking of bread and wine, and it's, it involves a reading. Uh, and then exhortation takes place, of course. Um, John 13 to 17 effectively forms Christ's word of exhortation. John, unlike all the others, devotes five chapters to, um, to, to effectively exhortation by Christ for, for his disciples. There's a prayer of thanksgiving, of course, as Christ does before the bread and wine. There's self-examination involved uh, prior to partaking. Christ says, one of you is going to betray me. The disciples think to themselves, think to themselves oh, is that going to be me? There's, there's a, a self-examination process involved. Um, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11 
of course, <clears throat> demonstrates, <clears throat> demonstrates this principle for us as well. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So there's a self-examination process involved. There's the partaking of bread and wine. Uh, a him is son, of course, after, afterwards. Um, <clears throat> there's even collections involved. 1 Corinthians 16 tells us that concerning the collection for the saints, that upon the first day of the week, ah, that's interesting, that's the day that you meet for the, to partake in bread and wine. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him. So it's collections. <clears throat> and then, then there's talking and conversing afterwards. When in Acts chapter 20, verse 11, uh, after the death and resurrection, as it were, of Eutychus, uh, he, he, when, he, when this had happened uh, and they'd come up back into the upper room and they'd broken bread, uh, and eaten, they talked. Uh, it talked a long while, we're told. Strong's tells us that that word talked means to commune or to converse. So there's a conversation, there's a two way uh, dialogue that takes place afterwards. So there's, there's a conversation that takes place um, after the memorial meeting to discuss the word of exhortation. So um, <clears throat> when you look at those verses and you look at those concepts, you suddenly go, <clears throat> hang on. This is exactly the same model or very similar model that we follow today. Uh, so it's not simply that um, that some one of you know Brother Roberts or Brother Thomas decided that this is how the more, more, more meaning is going to be, and that's that's just now what we do because they've said that. We follow these things because these Bible principles and Bible precedent for us to, to provide order and structure to the more meeting. Now there's, there's some places that are very keen on effectively creating change every time you come to the meeting. So every time you come to the meeting, you're not really sure, oh, is the meeting going to be run this way or is it going to run this way today? Some places it's entirely up to the presiding brother as to whether you have this many hymns or, <clears throat> or um, you know, or whether you have this first or that second or um, whether you bypass the stage completely, whatever it is. <clears throat> yes, I appreciate totally. There's variation within the way we do things, and that's totally fine that that's the case. Um, but I think it's also like important that um, the, what we do has an order and a structure to it that we follow. So <clears throat> now the next question is, well, how should we prepare for the emblems? <clears throat> well, here's a few thoughts. What should we do beforehand? What should we do before the emblems? Well, um, I know of someone who, the night before, um, at the very least, makes the conscious decision to clear his mind. So he doesn't allow his mind to be filled with um, reading the news or um, with entertainment of some kind, of watching something or uh, following something um, that's just not going to be helpful for, for the memorial meeting the next day. Um, he stays away from all that, so he keeps his mind uncluttered by all the junk that the world tries to distract our minds with. Um, <clears throat> of course, another principle, <clears throat> another principle is to not stay up late. Um, can be really easy to do. Sometimes there's very good reasons for doing that, um, so it's not always possible to, to keep that one. But where possible, get a good night's sleep so that when we come to the memorial, memorial meeting the next day, and minds aren't tired and exhausted and fatigued and unreceptive to God's word. Um, the spirit may be willing, but yes, the flesh is weak. So uh, the principle is allow ourselves the best opportunity that we can so that when the memorial meeting comes around, when it's time to focus on the exhortation, when it's time to uh, partake of bread and wine, we have minds that are the very best readiness and, and very best readiness that we can prepare them for. Um, what about that morning? Well, of course, going to Sunday school is, is great preparation if you're of that age or if you have a senior class. Um, I'm not sure if you even have Sunday school at the moment in lockdown. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, there's other things that you can do if, if you're not. Listening to hymns is helpful. Uh, personal Bible study, of course. Um, uh, uh, in the 10 minutes before the meeting starts itself, uh, I don't know about your ecclesia, but Generally, in a lot of places, there's designated quiet time. There's, a, some, there's some sort of expectation that you're sitting down, uh, that you are preparing. <clears throat> um, 
that there's, uh, you're sitting quietly in your, in your seat. You're not rushing around. You're not going to the bathroom. You're not distracted by your phone. You've, you've put your phone away. You've got your Bible out or your hymn book out, or you're just simply sitting there focusing your mind on, on what's to come. Um, I know that when I was a little younger, um, when I first got baptized, I would make a habit of reading sections from the blood of Christ, little little um, booklet by Brother Roberts. And I kept it in the back of my Bible. And uh, in the few minutes before the meeting, I'd pull it out and open it and read a section from that just to focus my mind on what was to come. Um, so reading a section from a spiritual book or, of course, reading a section from scripture can be helpful. Um, some ecclesias have a hymn for meditation. Um, and so uh, this is helpful because, of course, in preparation for the meeting starting in and of itself, the organist or, or pianist plays the hymn and everyone just sits there and reads the words as the hymn has been played and focuses on those words. So this is just a few things that you can do as an individual or as an ecclesia to help you prepare. Um, Self-examinations involve, um, of course, uh, in this. And I think it, it's best done beforehand. As we said from um, 1 Corinthians 11, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now, of course, uh, it's not wrong to examine yourself whilst we partake of the emblems, but the time in which we partake of the emblems is best used for what? Remembering Christ, not getting caught up in our own faults and our own failings and sins and asking for forgiveness. We examine ourselves first, then we partake and remember Christ. If our focus every time we partake of bread and wine is all about our failings, we've suddenly made the memorial feast all about ourselves. The focus of the bread and wine should be all about what God has achieved in Christ and not what we have failed to achieve. So that's really important. Self-examination, do it beforehand. Don't turn up to the meeting have bread and wine and suddenly go, now I'm going to stop and think about my life and pause and reflect and examine myself. Do it beforehand. Do it the night before. Do it that morning. Whatever it is, uh, do it beforehand. Um, now, um, what do we think about in bread and wine? No, I appreciate it. Probably a little bit, running a little bit late. So I'll, I'll move things towards wrapping up. We're not far away from finishing. Um, so what do we think about during bread and wine? Well, I guess... The answer is, firstly, there's nothing specifically prescribed. There's no set rule. You've got to think this or do this. Um, it's an intensely personal thing. So one person might have their eyes open. One person might have their eyes closed. That's okay. Uh, we might have different things that we focus on one from each other. Um, what we think about ourselves might vary from week to week. We might pray. We might just simply choose to pause and meditate. But nevertheless, what are the key principles that we should think about when partaking of bread and wine? I'm just going to run through five of these. Uh, firstly, the principle of thankfulness, because when Christ ordained it, he thanked God uh, before partaking. And of course, uh, Colossians 1 talks about us giving thanks, uh, thanks for Christ's redeeming work and receiving the forgiveness of sins. There's a huge degree of thankfulness in our receiving of bread and wine. We also do it, of course, to remember Christ. Do this in remembrance of me. Our lives that we live are usually so busy, it's hard to bring to the front of our minds the work of Christ as often as we should. Doing this once a week is like a minimum um, to remember the work of Christ, to reset our minds um, and to think upon him. We do it for susten sustenance as well. It's a spiritual meal. Uh, John 6 says, labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give to you. I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes in me shall never thirst. So we need to, um, we need to sh share in these things because it is uh, the way in which we receive spiritual strength. Um, we do this in fellowship because we do it with Christ and we do it with each other. When the disciples broke bread initially, they did it with one accord. And, um, and it's called the communion of the body and of the blood of Christ. They ate the same thing. They did it together in the same place. Uh, and 
when they did it, they looked out for each other um, in a positive way. Rather than judging each other, they were looking out for each other. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together uh, to eat, tarry one for another. First Corinthians 11 verse 30 tells us. And the last thing is identification. That is, we follow Christ in the spirit of his sacrifice. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. How do we show it? Well, we show it because we follow Christ. His sacrifice, uh, we are demonstrating those principles in the way that, in what we're thinking and in our way of life. Now, in conclusion, <clears throat> uh, one last thing, which is simply this. We've looked at a, a huge range of different things, uh, key principles. Now we're going to just conclude with what should we feel? Um, what should we feel when we come to partaking of bread and wine? The answer is we should feel a mixture of two things. We should feel uh, sorrow and solemnity because, of course, uh, like the disciples were exceedingly sorrowful because Christ said, one of you shall betray me. When we come to think of the weakness of man, this brings a degree of sorrow because we appreciate that our lives fall short compared to his example. Uh, and of course, we're coming to consider his death, um, which is a, a somber and a solemn thing. For as often as you eat this uh, bread and drink this cup, you just show the Lord's death till he come. It's a, it's a serious thing. So it's appropriate that we should come with a degree of solemnity. Like we're not here just to have a laugh, of course. Like, this is this is like a this is absolutely a serious thing. Um, we're thinking about the death of someone that we love, um, which of course brings a degree of uh, solemnity to the occasion. To the occasion, but it also brings a degree of gladness and joy related to uh, the power of God and Christ's resurrection to eternal life. Because when the disciples met together to partake of bread and wine. They did so with gladness and singleness of heart. Romans 5, we've read this before, but when we used to be enemies to the cross of Christ, but being enemies once upon a time, Christ died for the ungodly, and we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, and we're saved by his life. Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So when we come to partake of bread and wine, uh, it's it's we 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 have this um, we think upon both both these both these aspects his death and his resurrection, which brings a degree of solemnity but also a degree of joy. And I think sometimes when we share in bread and wine, look around the room, of course the, the mood is very solemn and it should be, um, but we can sometimes dwell on the death of Christ. Uh, which of course is why we're there to remember the death of Christ, but we can sometimes forget to spend time on dwelling on his resurrection. Our experience whilst remembering our Lord's sacrifice should encompass not only the somberness of his death, but also the joy of his resurrection. If Christ hasn't risen, we are of all men most miserable, but he has, he has risen. And to the joy that the disciples felt upon hearing that he was alive again, should be as also every time we partake of bread and wine in remembrance of him they were motivated to continue the work of emulating the spirit of his sacrifice so may their blazing joy and courage and conviction be added to when we do partake of bread and wine mm -hmm.